Hello, and welcome to Do Process the Interviews. This is Trevor Wadden. Before getting to today's interview, I wanted to again remind people that this feed, Do Process the Interviews, should be understood as a side podcast feed for our main show, which is simply called Do Process. Again, we're in the process of producing our first season for Due Process, which will be a documentary-style podcast following the narrative of a case while also examining Canada's criminal justice system. Our first season will examine the BC case of Peter Beckett, who was charged with the 2010 murder of his wife. Beckett has undergone two jury trials and many twists and turns, and we look forward to discussing these twists and turns and Beckett's case in the upcoming first season. In terms of timeline, my goal is to have the first season released by November of 2021. And again, we are a small team here, and we're working to achieve this goal, so stay tuned for further updates. My email is in the show notes, so please reach out with feedback, and please subscribe to both feeds, both Do Process the Interviews and Do Process, if you like what you hear. Moving on, today's interview features Dr. Ryan Fitzgerald, Professor of Forensic Psychology and Law at Simon Fraser University. Ryan and I discuss the topics of eyewitness identification, police lineups, and photo packs. We touch on a number of issues and topics in our conversation today, including memory, the accuracy of our memory generally, changes in memory as we age, how our memory can lead us astray, challenges of identifying criminals, the purpose of police lineups and photo packs, the different versions of the lineup procedure, the challenges of administering an appropriate lineup, and the best practices to incorporate when using lineups. Ryan was an excellent guest and really walked me through the fascinating area of police lineups and the science of police lineups. I learned a lot, and I hope you do too. Without further delay, Dr. Ryan Fitzgerald. Hello, and welcome to Due Process. This is Trevor Wadden. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Ryan Fitzgerald, Professor of Forensic Psychology and Law at Simon Fraser University. Ryan and I will be discussing topics related to eyewitness identification, police lineups, and memory. Ryan obtained his PhD in Experimental and Applied Psychology from the University of Regina. His research focuses on improving eyewitness identification accuracy and understanding how eyewitnesses make decisions. Ryan has authored and co-authored numerous papers which have appeared in such publications as Applied Cognitive Psychology, Law and Human Behavior, and the Journal of Experimental Psychology. Ryan, thank you for joining me today. Glad to be here. So Ryan, I do want to just chat a bit more about your background, and I gave a brief introduction there, but what led you to forensic psychology? Is this something you've always had an interest in? I wouldn't say that. I was in my undergraduate studies. I was learning about things like cognitive psychology, and I came across a book by Dan Schachter called Seven Sins of Memory. And I really loved the book. I I thought it was so neat because, you know, I knew that I forget things, but that book really talked about the different types of of memory errors that can occur. And I I found that just fascinating. I thought it would be great to study something like memory for for a living. And and, and one of the reasons I was really attracted to it is it's something that lay people understand, but it's something that they don't know everything about. So they'll know a little bit about what I do and I can teach them something new. The other thing that is that as an undergraduate student, my memory was constantly being measured. So it didn't take me much to, to see how the scientific method could be applied to study memory. And I, I took a course on psychology and law. Uh, the, the professor was uh, someone named Heather Price, and I ended up doing an honors thesis uh, with her and another professor named Chris Oriot on lineups and studying lineups ever since. That's really interesting. The book you mentioned, Seven Sins of Memory, who was the author of that? Daniel Schachter, he's at Harvard University. So was that kind of your first experience then with, you said you you knew that you would forget things, but kind of your first exposure to some of the the pitfalls of our memory? Certainly the, some of the different types, like, you know, for example, and it it was really just putting labels on things I'd already experienced. Like, for example, you know, one of his sins was called blocking. And I'd never heard that term before I read that book. But this is where, you know, something's on the tip of your tongue, maybe, and something that you know, but you just can't access it at at that particular time. So it really opened my eye to to this study of, of all the different types of memory errors. And a lot of them have a really relation to the things I study now with with police lineups. You mentioned the scientific method. Is there any difficulty with studying memory where it is where you are relying on subjective experiences in a lot of these cases? Because I would imagine you're doing, I know you guys are looking at data and you're doing lots of research, but you are relying on subjective experiences. So is that a barrier to study this area or is that something that can be overcome? 
Right. Well, well, in the experimental context, it, it's something that, that we can overcome by, by creating events where we know exactly what happened for the witness. So, so we will stage a crime, for example, and we'll have hundreds of people observe that same crime. We'll have specific details in that crime and specific people appear in that crime. Uh, so we know the ground truth, and, and that lends itself to objectively studying whether they got it right or wrong. And for example, we can use a video and see what they can remember of that. And then we can objectively score whether, whether they remember something or not. So there, there are ways that you guys can monitor how these experiences and keep a baseline. Yeah, we, we can study it objectively. And, and what I was getting at earlier when I, I was just clarifying whether you, you're referring to applying it to a criminal case, that's where it gets a bit more tricky because we don't know what happened in that criminal case. And we know general patterns that tend to occur in most cases, but each individual case has, has so many interactive variables that it, it, it becomes less objective when, when we're trying to say, yeah, this witness did see that or not. That, that becomes more of a, an estimating case. Game that, that we're not as good at as we are with when we're doing our studies. So just turning to a general discussion about memory, Ryan, I think it's important that we start there. It will inform our conversation as we, we move forward in dis- discussing eyewitness identification and police lineups. So in general, can you give us a sense of how accurate our memory is? Yeah, it's a, it's a big question and, and also a complicated one because memory is generally reliable, but it's also highly fallible. So, um, and there's individual differences in memory. So some people have bad memories, other people, you know, have impressively good memories. And most people have memories that are good enough that when, you know, they spontaneously tell you that something happened and they're certain it happened and they're being honest, you should get the gist right. I'm thinking of, for example, I went on a trip to Europe 10 years ago and I can remember the first hotel hotel we stayed at. And I remember that it was a few minutes walk to the beach with 100% certainty. I know that that's a fact. But the problem is when uh, we're asked to to go beyond the gist and, and accurately recall the finer grain details, things that we call verbatim memory. You know, for example, if you ask me, what was my room number at that hotel? I haven't got a clue. And, and really, we forget most of what we experience. And this is actually an adaptive process because once I check out of the hotel, that room number doesn't have any adaptive value for me anymore. And actually, the sooner I forget it, the less likely it's going to interfere with my ability to remember the next hotel room. So our memory is impressively efficient, but at the same time, most of what we experience in our past is forgotten. So it, it can lead us in, in to misremember things or, or forget. So this verbatim memory or clearing it after, you know, your trip to Europe, for example, is this an issue of storage space or just it's impossible to remember everything we'd be, our brains just couldn't, couldn't take it? Yeah, the issue of storage space is a, an interesting one because uh, there, there's debate about whether there's some things that we just don't encode. So some things just never make it into our, our long-term memory. But the things that do, there, there's a real question about whether, you know, eventually they, they just go away or eventually we just lose access to those memories. So it's less considered an issue of storage, but again, more of an issue of efficiency. So if, if I stored every hotel room number that every hotel I've ever stayed at, when I'm trying to remember one, uh, maybe one really important one, like the one I, I'm currently staying at, there's more room for interference from those previous ones. So it's more likely that I'll mistakenly think of another one if that's still active in, in my memory trace and I'm much less likely to get those mixed up if I only have one with a good memory trace to it. Right. That kind of reminds me of me when I, I, I've moved a lot in the last number of years and trying to remember my mm. postal code, for example, <laughs> it's always a struggle for me for a while. It takes me a little bit of time to, to forget the other ones. Yeah. Your, your memory is doing you a favor. You, you know, occasionally you do need to remember your old postal code, but more often than not, it's, it's helpful to just forget that stuff. Okay. So I think there's some people in our society that think of our memory as like a video camera where we're able to remember all these details and we're pretty accurate. Over time, Ryan, is, our, is, that, is that a fair representation of our memory or is it more fluid and, and changing than most of us know? 
Yeah, no, it's, it's not an accurate representation of how memory works. This video camera idea, uh, that this idea that we, we just record what's happening and we can just access that recording when we need to, that, that's just not how memory works. It, we're far too efficient for a system like that. Uh, instead, what we have is a system that, as I applied earlier, we tend to just retain the gist of what happened. And for the most part, that's effective enough to, to get us by in our day-to-day -day experiences. And when we're forced to remember more than the gist, when we're asked to remember more of that verbatim information about exactly what happened, we tend to rely on something called the schema. So the schema is something, so for example, when I uh, stay at a hotel, go, going back to that example, I have a schema for what normally happens. So normally I'll, you know, I'll check in at the, at the front desk and I'll go up the elevator and I'll walk into the room and then I'll have a look around. And if, if you ask me about, well, tell me exactly what happened when you stayed at this hotel, I'm just going to go to that gist for what normally happens. And then I'm going to fill in the blanks of the details as best as I can through a reconstructive process. So, you know, I'm might remember specific details, but more likely all I'll truly remember is the gist of what happened. And, and I'll be using this script to try to try to fill in the blanks of, of the details of what happened. So is the, the schema, is that based on experiences that we've had in the past? Yes. So, it, you know, if you've never done something before, uh, you won't have a schema. But the more and more you do something, the more developed that schema becomes and, and the more uh, you're likely to rely on that schema and, and reconstruct using that. So, yeah, the, the more you experience an event or a, or a category of events, the stronger your schema will be for that event, but the harder it will be to keep track of the details of, of which event occurred. So uh, this, this often comes up in the case of repeated abuse, where you know, a witness is asked to describe a specific time that something happened. And if something only happened once, that's not very difficult to do, right? Because it's a very unique experience. But if someone was repeatedly abused, it becomes very difficult for them to keep the, the details associated with the particular occurrence of, of when they happened. So when, when you're relying on these experiences and you're filling in the, the gaps, I think is what you said earlier, is it possible then to be filling in the gaps with things that haven't actually occurred in that particular circumstance or that, like, for example, you go into the, the hotel room, you might be, you might be using details from another trip that you went 20 years ago type of thing. It is possible. Uh, trips are, our, our memory for trips is, is one of the more reliable types of memories because the context of me being in Spain is quite different than the context of me being in Tokyo, for example. So that helps to separate those events. But when you have a similar event, like let's say uh, you go to Toronto every year, that's when you start becoming more likely to, to mix up which year, which thing happened. So this mixing up, though, it is relatively common then in our recall and our memory? Yeah, highly common, especially for events that are repeated. So events that, that happen over and over again, it's easy to mix up when something happened. If it's a very unique experience, those are less likely to, to get mixed up with other events. From a legal context, I think, you know, I've, I've seen it when I was a lawyer and, and even just you watch TV and movies and things and this difficulty recalling or ha being able to specifically say this happened at this time and this date is often used against people to diminish their credibility. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think that's a fair assessment or is that just part of being human? Uh, it's, it's one of those, it depends kind of an answer. I hate to give you one of those, but oftentimes when, when people are, are questioned at trial and they, they make inconsistencies, that's used against them. And it really depends on the type of inconsistency uh, about whether it should be used against them or not. So like I said, if, if it's something quite unique experience where there's no reason that they should, should get that mixed up, that might be something that you, you question. But if, it's, if it is something like, what did you have for breakfast that day? And you have breakfast every day and, and that's something that's easily to, to get mixed up. So I think it really depends on the context of, of what they're, they're getting mixed up. So I want to now just turn to discussing how our memory changes as we age. Can you give us an idea of how our memory does change adult versus children? 
Sure. There's been a lot of uh, research comparing people of different ages and, and their memories. And what that research shows is that young adults generally perform better than both children and older adults. And I'm referring to older adults as people who are 65, 70 plus kind of thing. And there are all sorts of challenges in this research because you're not usually randomly assigning people to be a certain age. So it's, it's, it's not true experimental work, but all the evidence suggests that memory and, and our general cognitive abilities develop until early adulthood when our brain growth starts to slow. And then memory levels off during adulthood and then begins to decline, as I mentioned, at around age 60. And this isn't true of all types of memory. So our knowledge of facts, for example, which we refer to as semantic memory, uh, that's usually not a, a, as big of a problem if, if someone's uh, experiencing healthy aging. But where the decline tends to occur is in memory for experiences, which is what we call episodic memory. And as we start to age, we become more likely to forget things like what happened yesterday than memory for you know what the name of a city is or what, for example, how to perform a certain skill. And then also with, with older age, we become less efficient at learning new information. And when you're when you're doing these studies, Ryan, do, do you notice that there's different processes that adults and children mm. use in terms of memory? Uh, the, the processes are similar, but it's uh, the, there there are some differences within those processes. So, for example, you know, young children are, are reasonably good at knowing when they've seen something before, which which is what we call familiarity. But their threshold for saying that something is familiar is lower than adults. So they tend to make more mistaken judgments that something is familiar. And when something is truly familiar, children are not as good as adults at remembering where it's familiar from. And this is a process that we call recollection. So not necessarily different processes, but they're just not as good at managing those processes as young adults are. The other thing is that children are more likely to get if they don't know the right answer. This is especially true if they're being asked by someone who's an authority figure, like a police officer, but even just a parent would have that effect. So that's one big difference is that children tend to want to you know, give uh, the answer that they think the person wants to hear. Okay. And we'll talk about how this may add to the complexities of a police lineup and dealing with children. But I want to just discuss spatial recognition briefly here with you as well. Because in your articles and research that I reviewed for this interview, you mentioned that this is a distinct form of recognition. Can you tell us why this is or how it is distinct? Sure. Well, faces are special in, in a few ways. Unlike other stimuli, uh, we're, we're hardwired for recognizing faces. So we've evolved to discriminate between faces of similar looking people, and we can do this from infancy. And we have specific locations in the brain that are involved in processing faces, most notably the, the fusiform gyrus or the fusiform face area in uh, the temporal lobe. And another big difference uh, between faces and, and other things that we might be recognizing is that faces are processed holistically. So rather than processing all the features in a face piecemeal, the features are integrated and processed as a whole. And, and we know there's strong perceptual integration of faces from what we call inversion studies. So this is where we, we flip faces upside down and, and we test recognition of those upside down faces. And what we see is that face recognition performance is not only impaired by this inversion, it's disproportionately impaired. So, so other classes of stimuli aren't uh, impaired as strongly as faces are. And, and the clearest evidence is, is from another experimental method called the that's used to explore something called the composite face effect. So this is where you show someone that the top half of a face, and then you show them that, that same top of the face later, but you align it with a new bottom half of the face. And people have real difficulty recognizing that top half of the face when you do this, because they can't help but perceive these two halves of the face as a completely new face. And we know that holistic processing is the issue here, because when you misalign those two halves of the face, that gets rid of, of the impairment. So are we better at remembering faces than, than other objects generally? Yeah, actually, we faces are one of the things that we're, we're best able to recognize. And that, that doesn't mean that we can't get it wrong. Uh, it just means that it's compared to other stimuli. It, it's Faces are things that we're attracted to. So we pay attention to faces and they are remembered better than, than other stimuli. 
And in terms of just going back to memory, we, we chatted a bit about how we're generally we're good at remembering the gist of something. So how can our memory lead us astray in terms of believing we so confidently that we have remembered something correctly, but finding out later that, no, oh, actually, I was wrong about this thing. How, how can our memory lead us astray in that way? Well, you know, there's there's two issues there. One is that we make mistakes in our memory, and the other is that uh, we make mistakes in assessing the the accuracy of our memories. So, in terms of why we or how we can make mistakes, uh, you know, I think back to the the research of Elizabeth Loftus, you know, showing that just the way you phrase a question can influence how we remember a previous experience, and that was some of her earliest stuff. And she eventually went on to show, and other people have shown this as well, that that we can have rich false memories for or entire events that, that we didn't experience. And, and we can come to believe that we did experience them. And then often where our belief in the memory becomes distorted, our belief that, that the memory is accurate, is if there's some form of suggestion. So the example that immediately comes to mind is in the context of lineups. So if, if someone identifies uh, someone, and maybe it was a bit of a, a reluctant identification, maybe at the time of the identification, they said, well, you know, I, I think it might be, you know, number four, I'm not too sure. And, you know, they record the identification and then they tell the witness, congratulations, you identified the suspect. That was the person that we highly suspected had committed the crime. And, and out of these 10 people in this lineup, you picked that person. So great job. If that happens, any hesitancy that witness might have had at the time of the identification, it's totally gone by the time they get to trial. Especially when there is, at one point, there's there's uncertainty in the memory. When someone positively reinforces that memory, we can become quite confident that it's true. Right. Okay. Just before we get into discussing police lineups in more detail here, can you just give us an idea of how wrongful convictions, in particular in, from the U.S. studies and research, shed light on the issue of faulty eyewitness testimony? Sure. The scientific study of eyewitness testimony uh, was happening in, in the 1970s, 1980s. People were doing studies showing that, uh, I've already mentioned uh, the work of Loftus, showing that people could make mistakes in memory. You also had people uh, like uh, Gary Wells and, and Rod Lindsay who were staging crimes, and they were finding that you know over half of the people who, who saw these crimes were, when they were shown a lineup, they were identifying the wrong person. But these were just psychology studies, and, and there were never any consequences when the participants made a mistake. So there was some skepticism that these numbers that they were getting in the studies were going to translate into anything near that in real cases where the witness would know that if they made a mistake, they could put an innocent person in prison. So, you know, before the wrongful convictions, researchers were calling for reforms uh, to protect potentially innocent people, but nobody in the criminal justice system was listening. That all changed with the advent of forensic DNA testing. And that's because when we started, so first of all, the volume of wrongful convictions was one thing that really got people paying attention to, to the same these psychology studies. But the other thing is that when we started looking at these wrongful convictions and, and assessing what went wrong, what we were finding is that misidentification was a common factor in many of these cases. So for example, in the first 40 DNA exonerations, 90% of those involved mistaken eyewitness identification. And we don't think that that eyewitness identification is a factor in, in 90% of, of all wrongful convictions now. But at the time, that was crucial for bringing attention to the issue of mistaken identification. And it, it clearly paved the way for psychological research to have an impact on, on the reform of line of procedures. In a moment, we'll get into discussing why eyewitness identification can go askew or with the issues that may influence our memory in this context here. But I will turn now to just briefly discussing police lineups. And although I'm sure everyone who listens to this interview will understand generally what a police lineup is, I'm going to ask the very obvious question. Can you just walk us through what a police lineup is and what the purpose of it is? Sure. The purpose of a police lineup is to test the hypothesis that uh, a suspect is guilty. So police will do an investigation after a crime occurs, and that will ideally lead them to a guilty person, the person who committed that crime. But they need evidence to support their belief that that person is guilty. And 
Uh, before lineups became a thing, what police would do is they would just show a suspect to a witness and they would ask, is this the person that you saw? But with this procedure, which uh, we typically call this a show up now, there's no way of determining that the eyewitness is credible. You know, the eyewitness could be getting it wrong every time and there'd be no way of knowing. And show ups are also just highly suggestive because you've, you're basically telling the witness who you think the suspect is. So eventually judges demanded a more rigorous way of testing whether the suspect is guilty. And the solution was to present a suspect along with other people who we call fillers. And in a nutshell, that's what a lineup is. And we chatted earlier, Ryan, about how we are generally good at remembering faces. There's an intuitive sense that if you witness somebody committing a crime, it's going to be pretty straightforward to identify that person. Is identifying a criminal as easy as some people believe? No, it's not, particularly if the, the person was previously unfamiliar. So w when I'm talking about lineups, I'm, I'm usually referring to the what we call stranger identifications. And I do think that people are becoming more aware of how difficult it can be to identify someone you only saw once. You know, the science in, of eyewitness identification and the issue of wrongful conviction, they're, they're becoming more and more a part of the popular culture. But I would say most people are still naive about how hard it can be to identify a stranger. And one way that we see this in our research is that when, you know, we stage an event for witnesses to watch, and before we do the lineup test, we ask them, uh, how confident are you that you'll be able to identify someone if we show you a lineup? And what we find in those studies is that their pre-assessment of how likely they are that they'll be able to identify that person, they're not very informative. And they're much less informative than if you ask them after they've done it. And that's it suggests that people expect it's going to be easier than it turns out to be. And, you know, for example, they just might not anticipate that, you know, the, there might be more than one person in the lineup who, who matches what they remember about the perpetrator. So I think people underestimate what the experience of, of a lineup procedure will be like. Has the police lineup developed because of case law or because of the forensic psychology and things that psychologists are aware of, or is it a combination of both? So the, yeah, the origins of lineups are, are something that I can't be too certain of, but I can tell you that uh, there, there was a review of identification procedures and, and wrongful convictions in England. It was organized by a retired high court judge named Devlin. And Devlin reviewed the history and he traced it back to around, I think it was the 1860s. And he found it happened in the context of case law, where I think it was an appeals court judge. And actually now I'm wondering if even there was a, I don't think there actually was a criminal court of appeal in the 1860s in England. So it must have been just a, a trial judge who who said, look, you know, this, this show of procedures isn't, isn't good enough. And, and he forced, this judge forced them to, to come up with something better. So that's often what's given as the origin story for lineups. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if people were doing something similar before then. But that, that's often what, what people give for, for the origin story. So it's been around for a little while. Yeah, yeah. And and yeah, to answer the the second half of your question, it it's not something that developed there there was no science of it at the time. This was just something that they they invented in response to, you know, a judge wanting something more than a show up. Okay. So do we know anything today, Ryan, about how often police lineups are used in Canada for instance? Do, are they a common part of a police investigation? Yes, lineups are a common investigative tool, and it's because often uh, physical evidence is either unavailable. So, for example, uh, Barry Sheck from the Innocence Project estimates that only about 10% of cases have DNA evidence. Or, you know, there is physical evidence, but it's circumstantial. So, you know, fingerprints can show you that, that someone was at the crime scene, but they can't tell you what they were doing when they were there or even when they were there. So that can open the door to reasonable doubt. And the reason that lineups are so common is that they provide direct evidence of guilt. If you've got a witness who says, I saw this person committing this crime, that can tie together all that circumstantial evidence that you get from physical samples collected at the crime scene, for example. And I don't have hard numbers for how many lineups are administered in Canada. As far as I know, that's that's not something that's tracked. But I, I can give you an example out of England where they do, to be fair, more, more lineups than, than most places. But estimates in the UK is that they, they're doing upwards of, of 100,000 lineups per year. So it's not, it's not a rare thing that happens. Right. And obviously, the ID of a suspect or person who has committed a crime is an essential part of any criminal offense. You can't charge somebody if you don't know who they are. So it is a very important aspect of any criminal investigation. Exactly. 
And so I'll ask now about some of the more common forms of lineup procedures because different countries and jurisdictions use different methods and procedures. Can you walk us through what some of the more common forms of lineup procedures are? Well, the traditional lineup uh, was that, you know, people or the police rather would round up uh, people from the street to appear with a suspect and the lineup members would all stand in a row and the witness would walk up and down the lineup inspecting each person. And it's still done similarly to that in, in places like South Africa and India. But in Canada and the US, the, the common practice is to use photo lineups or photo arrays, sometimes they're referred to. And the, the two main ways of showing the, the photo lineups are either by simultaneous presentation where the witness can view all the lineup members at the same time or with sequential presentation. And there are different ways of doing sequential lineups, but the essential feature is that the lineup members are shown one at a time. Okay. The sequential, it's shown one at a time. My understanding from other conversations is the investigator will ask the person once they're shown the photo, they have to make a decision at the time before they move on to the next photo, or does that differ from department to department? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and uh, the, the the original sequential lineup, as de- designed by psychologists, was exactly as you described. So uh, this was Rod Lindsay and Gary Wells in 1985. They published a paper where they used a sequential lineup that had what what I would refer to and what's commonly referred to as strict instructions. And the instructions were that you're only going to get to see each person once. You must make a decision before you can see the next person. And the decision you make is going to be final. You, you can't go back and say, well, can I see number two again? And that, that was the procedure that they designed. Over the years, uh, not only have, have psychologists started playing around with, with those rules, in, in practice, different rules have, have been in place. So for example, in the UK, they use sequential presentation, but they don't get a decision until the end. So the witness has to view the entire lineup twice, actually, and they're not allowed to make a response uh, until the end. From the research, do we know if there is a preferred procedure or a procedure that will result in higher accuracy? That's a question that you're going to get uh, different answers depending on who you ask. The the consensus used to be that sequential presentation was better. And, you know, that that consensus is is has fallen apart basically. The old research was all showing a sequential advantage, but a lot of the more recent research has been showing a simultaneous advantage. And the explanation uh, often given for for the changing story is that the old research, uh, when we were doing that, we were analyzing the data in in a way that was misleading. And I've looked at the new studies, however, and, and, and I find that it doesn't matter how you analyze the data, you still see a simultaneous advantage. And and this, you know, my personal view is that the simultaneous advantage in these newer studies has something to do with the experimental methods that they're using. Uh, We've already talked about how there's different types of sequential procedures. So for example, one practice that has has suddenly developed in the experimental literature is that even though it wasn't part of the the original procedure that was developed in 1985, what what people have started doing is saying, uh, before they show the lineup, only the first person that you say yes to, yes, that's the person, only that one's going to count. And we're starting to explore how those types of instructions might be influencing the responses to to the lineup. But there's also, you know, whether you can go back and forth. And and we're still just really learning about how all these different variations might be affecting performance on the sequential lineup. So it might be that that some sequential lineups are better than others. There's also an an issue that uh, we used to do uh, experiments by getting people into the lab and and testing them by conducting an interview with those witnesses. And in that context, you can really explain how the sequential procedure is going to work. A lot of these newer studies, they they do uh, online data collection. So they'll they'll have people who, who are completing the study from home. And, you know, a simultaneous lineup doesn't really need a lot of explaining, right? It's you show the pictures, you identify someone, or you, you select the not there option. But with sequential lineups, because they are a bit complicated, it could be possible that the online testing has something to do with this. But I mean, the bottom line is that there isn't agreement about whether sequential lineups are better than simultaneous lineups or the other uh, way around. But there, there's some people that, that hold strong views uh, on both sides. Okay. So it, it sounds like there's still a lot of research that needs to be done and there's disagreement maybe in the, the field. 
Yeah, there is. And, you know, when I say that, sequential versus simultaneous presentation is one of the, the few things where we, we've done field studies with, with real witnesses where we've randomly assigned them to see one or the other. And those studies tend to suggest that it doesn't really matter so much which way you do it. So on the one hand, yeah, I mean, there, there is still uh, further research to do. But on the other hand, I'm not sure that it's the most important uh, variable that needs to be studied. Okay, so maybe I'm jumping ahead too far then. But if the way that it's presented isn't the most important variable, what are the other important variables that need to be considered? To me, one of the most important variables, and, and this is something that I, you know, it might be influenced by the fact that I've, I've studied this a lot, but I think there's growing consensus that, that one of the most important factors is who is in that lineup. So there's always a, a should be one suspect, and, and that's a really important thing that there's only one suspect, but also who are those other people in the lineup that we call fillers? And if you don't get the fillers right, there have been study after study showing that if there's an innocent suspect in that lineup with unsuitable fillers, witnesses are are highly inclined to identify that person. So that's one of the most important things. If I were to think of what the consensus is about one of the, the other big factors, the instructions that you give the witness before they see the lineup, who administers the lineup, and in particular, whether that person knows who the suspect is. These are the factors that I think might be more important than you know whether the, the images are presented all at once or one at a time. And when you're bringing in a, a witness or even a victim to do a photo, pack or a lineup, maybe the, the inference that they would draw is that, okay, the police must have somebody. They're bringing me in, so they, there must be the suspect in this lineup. That knowledge or that belief, does that influence or put a pressure on somebody when they're looking at a photo pack or a lineup to make a decision? Absolutely. Most people, when when, when they get called to the police station they, they to, to do a lineup, they, they think it's because they've got the perpetrator. So it changes the way they approach the task. They don't think they're going in to decide if the perpetrator's there or not. They think they're going in to, to find that perpetrator from amongst those photos. So it's very important to give them instructions to, to make them aware that the, the perpetrator might not be there. So like I said, I, I would be much more worried about the witness not receiving that instruction, that the perpetrator might not be in that lineup, than it would be about hearing you know how the, the photos were presented simultaneously. Sequentially. And the importance of fillers, making sure that the people that appear in the lineup or the photo pack are appropriate. What are some considerations that need to be implemented when you're presenting a photo pack or a lineup? Yeah, well, one of the most important things is, is making sure that whatever the witness has already described about the perpetrator, it's very important that if the perpetrator has any of those features, that the fillers also have those features. Because if you don't do that, like say, for example, the, the witness, when, when they were first asked about the crime, they said, oh, okay, well, it was a white guy who had a big nose. If you present them with a lineup that has anybody who doesn't have a big nose, that's going to bias them towards uh, the people who do have big noses in that lineup. And essentially, if you know, if you got a six-person lineup and only three of them have big noses, it's basically the equivalent of a three-person lineup because they can immediately discount anyone who doesn't uh, have the features that they've already described. So that's the the most important thing. But you know, matching to the description it might not be enough. So descriptions are, are often not very detailed. So if, if all you get is, you know, sometimes you just hear them say like, yeah, stocky white guy uh, in his 30s. Often they don't say much about the face. And, you know, if you're only matching uh, fillers to the features in the description, uh, you could end up with a bias lineup if, if you're only focusing on that. So the general recommendation now is that, yeah, definitely make sure they, they have all the features that were matched in the description. But there's also some general features uh, of the suspect that you should make sure that, that the fillers also have. Like they should also, of course, be the same ethnicity. They should be around the same age. They should have the same hair color, these kind of things. Anything distinctive, you want to make sure that those are matched. So you want to make sure that the suspect and the fillers, they're the same, not stick out or stand out. You're right. Yeah. The, the, the issue of, of someone standing out, it could be because there's only one person who matches the description. That would cause someone to stand out. You're right. If there's only one person with a big nose, that's going to cause them to stand out for a witness who reported there was a big nose. And the, the don't stand out rule, it actually goes farther than that. I'm thinking of a case in, in Canada, Thomas Sofino, a man who was wrongfully convicted. In that case, he was the only person in the lineup who was wearing a cowboy hat. He was the only person in the lineup who was photographed outside. He was the only person in the lineup 
who had a border around his photo. So the, sometimes it can be things other than the appearance of, of the person that can cause someone to stand out. And you, you absolutely need to standardize those other factors as well. And standardizing could be just the way that if it's a photo pack, for example, or the way the mug shots are taken, the clothing they're wearing, that sort of thing. Exactly. You know, you wouldn't want, say, the suspect photographed in, in with uh, HD high quality camera and the fillers, you know, photographed with a cheap phone camera or something like that. That's gonna, another way that someone could stand out. So absolutely, the, the, there should be standardization in, in how all these people are recorded. So you mentioned earlier, Ryan, that the, the photo pack is kind of the standard way of doing things in, in Canada. Is there an actual consensus or a requirement that police departments need to follow certain regulations or laws in presenting these photo packs? Uh, well, there, there are some rules that if they're not followed in Canada, they might run into uh, problems at trial. Some of these came actually from the Sofino case. So there was an inquiry into that case. And the judge who led that uh, inquiry, uh, Peter Corey, he issued a number of recommendations, and, and those were adopted into case law. And also there are guidelines that are issued by uh, the heads of prosecution from uh, the different provinces and territories. So starting in 2005, they, they issued a set of recommendations and they've updated them a couple times since then. So uh, in those guidelines, the recommendations are to have someone administer the lineup who does not know who the suspect is and who's independent from the investigation. It's also recommended to have 10 people in the lineup and, and only one of those being the suspect, the others being known innocent fillers who, who match the description and, and the suspect in significant features. Uh, in Canada, we recommend collecting a confidence statement, uh, or at least the heads of prosecution recommend a confidence statement at the end of the procedure. And they also recommend a sequential presentation in, in, in Canada. And again, these are, these are just recommendations. So these are these are guidelines, but they have been uh, endorsed by the in common law by the Supreme Court. And I've I've actually seen cases. So I, I can think of a case uh, from, from my hometown, Regina, where there was a witness observed someone who had a teardrop tattoo uh, underneath his, his eye. And then the police presented a lineup where there were nine people and only one of them had a teardrop tattoo underneath the eye. So it uh, didn't match the description. And the, the judge uh, referenced the, the Sofino uh, recommendations. And not only for, for not matching the description, also for, for not having enough people in the lineup. So only having nine people in the lineup rather than 10. I don't know if that would have, like the, the case was thrown out because of the, the description match, I, I presume. But, but they did also mention these other recommendations. But I, I see what you're, where you're getting at here and that each individual police agency has autonomy to interpret those, those recommendations and come up with their own policy. So there is very ability across jurisdictions. Absolutely. And just curious, the live lineup versus the photo lineup, is there any research to suggest one is better than the other? Well, there's a common belief among lay people that that live lineups are going to increase accuracy. So we've I've done research where we've just asked people, if you could choose whether you have a live lineup or a photo lineup or for a video lineup, almost everyone says, oh, I'd prefer to have a live lineup. And this belief has made its way into policies in many countries around the world where live lineups are given more weight than photo or video lineups. And when you when you think about how photo lineups are typically how they're administered, it's usually just uh, you know, a head and shoulder mug shot a static image and it makes a lot of intuitive sense that a live lineup would be helpful. You get to see the whole person. You can see them from different angles. You can ask them to walk and to talk. And, you know, the, the topic hasn't been the top of the agenda for, for scientists. So I'm, I'm reluctant to say there's any consensus. But I know the literature uh, on, on the, uh, the research that has been conducted, and I've conducted some research uh, myself on this issue, and I've never come, come across a single experiment showing that live lineups uh, result in better performance than photo or video lineups. And, and these are experiments where we've artificially removed many of the, the difficulties that would come up from conducting a live lineup in a real investigation. So in, in our studies, we use the same fillers in the live condition than, as in the photo condition, even though in, in a real case, it would be much harder to find fillers for a live lineup that would be as good as you can get from, from choosing from databases of tens of thousands of photos or videos. We also equate the delay across conditions. So even though in a real case, it takes longer to organize 
it's a live lineup, uh, we we don't count for that in the experiment. So we're, we're taking away some of these these real challenges that are that occur when you're trying to conduct a live lineup in a real case. And and even when we remove those those challenges in experiments, you don't get better performance with live lineups. So I I don't recommend conducting live lineups just because there's no evidence showing they're better and and they're so much more difficult to organize. You know, getting everyone all in the same place at the same time and to to administer in a controlled way. It's kind of like live television. If something goes wrong, the witness saw it go wrong and you can't let them unsee that. We talked about the, the different forms and ways you can administer these these police lineups and, and photo packs. I want to turn now to looking at it from the, the witness perspective. And can you tell us generally what type of social pressures may influence a person's selection during a uh, police lineup? Sure. We've already briefly touched upon the, the big social factors. So the one is that, you know, the expectation that the perpetrator is going to be in that lineup. That That's one social issue. The other main social pressure is that someone's got to administer that lineup. And anything that administrator says could influence the witness decision, especially if the administrator knows who the suspect is. But even if the witness just believes that the administrator knows, the line of procedure, you know, when we study it in the lab, sometimes we just treat it as a cognitive task. We get them on a computer to complete the experiment. But in a real case, it's much more of a conversation between the witness and the administrator. So, you know, occasionally you'll get a witness who looks at a lineup, identifies someone in five seconds, and, and that's a wrap. But other witnesses, you know, they're going to be staring at that lineup for 10 minutes before they make a decision. And that's where the social pressures are likely to occur. So you might you know, get a witness who makes a tentative decision. They might say, well, number four looks kind of similar. And the administrator, if they know that the suspect's actually number three, they might say to the witness, well, you know, don't rush. Take your time. And then, you know, the witness will interpret that as, okay, it's not number three. And then when the witness gets to number three and they say, well, that person also looks similar, the administrator says, tell me more about number three. And, and this is, you know, if the witness has any uncertainty uh, about their decision, they're going to be paying very close attention to these kind of comments from the administrator. And can you tell us about the type of cognitive factors that may impact a person's election in police lineups? Yeah. So these are the variables that we're most commonly studying in our experiments. And if you think about the way memories are formed, there's, there's kind of three stages. So that you encode the witnessed event, you store your memory for that event, and then you have to retrieve your memory for the, the event. And at encoding, there, there are many factors that can influence memory. So how long you saw the perpetrator for, how far away you were, whether you were able to pay attention. And then when you get to storage, you've got factors such as how long there was between the witnessed event and by the time they, they get the suspect and put that person into a lineup. There's also the possibility of interference. You might have encountered misinformation. So if the police might have shown you mugshots of the person or, or maybe you went searching on your own in social media. Maybe maybe you got a lead on your own and you're conducting your own little investigation. So these, these factors can all play a role. And then there's the conditions of the lineup procedure. So perhaps the perpetrator's appearance has changed since the time of the event. That's, that's going to reduce uh, the likelihood that you make a correct decision. You're also another cognitive factor is how similar the other lineup members are. So there are many, many cognitive factors. Factors, uh, that can play a role. Does it make sense, Ryan, for police agencies not to adopt a uniform method of police lineups or photo packs? What I mean by this is everybody's different in the way that they remember things and their, their mental capacity, etc. Should police agencies be kind of considering the witness that they're dealing with and then formulating the lineup to better match the characteristics? Or would you be concerned that this might be biasing a potential witness or victim? Yeah, I think there needs to be a uniform procedure that's followed. As soon as you start getting into accommodating different uh, witnesses, I, I suppose that the one exception might be if you've got a, a, I suppose there are certain groups where say you've got a vulnerable witness, probably need to take more time to build rapport with them. So I, you know, I'm already backtracking on my, my uniformity thing, but for the average witness, uh, there should be the average procedure, but there are some vulnerable groups that, that you would want to make some uh, accommodations accommodations for. So like I said, if someone knows that they have a bad memory, you might consider not even doing a, a lineup at all with them. Or if, if you know that, for example, they they didn't uh, get a good look at the person, again, really consider whether it's worth doing a lineup at all. 
uh, with children, you might want to introduce some, you know, because children are are more inclined to identify someone, even if the, the person's not in the lineup. You you might want to implement some some procedures to try to discourage them from from making identification more so than with your, your standard adult. That leads nicely into the the next question then about whether it, the age differences actually account for differences in identification accuracy. You've already suggested that when you're a young child, you might feel more pressure to make a selection. What else do we know about how age differences might impact the police lineup procedures? Yeah, well, that's the main finding there is that children are, are more likely when, when they're presented with a, a lineup that doesn't contain the perpetrator, they're more likely to, to just pick someone. And this is mostly attributed in children to their their desire to acquiesce to to the lineup administrator. So they're presented with some photos in front of them. They think it's their job to pick someone. That's what they tend to do. And there are some limitations to, to the research that has been done comparing children and older adults. One limitation is that uh, we almost always use a, a young adult as the perpetrator. And we know there's a known age bias in face recognition. So we're better at recognizing people of our own age. But you you know, we kind of justify this as as researchers because often the, the people who commit crimes are in that young adult category. So although it's not the best way to learn about the memories of, of children in comparison to adults, it is the, the most applicable way of studying memory in children and adults because uh, in, in the criminal context, less often that you're going to get a eight-year-old criminal or a 70-year-old criminal and much more likely that you're getting you know someone in the 20s. So is it easier then, Ryan, for if you're, you know, for example, I'm, I'm 33, and if I went in for a police lineup, is it easier for me to identify someone that's from my own age group? And as opposed to me, if the, the suspect was older, would I have a di- more difficult time identifying that person? Yeah, all the research says that, yes, uh, we're, we're better at identifying people who are in our own age group than people of, of other age groups. And there's been a bit of uh, research on this in the context of lineups, but it's most often studied um, in just face recognition paradigms where you, you get people looking at lots of pictures of, of younger people and older people and then being tested on a lot of pictures that they've seen before and some new pictures. And the reason that, that we're better at identifying people of our current age age is that these are the people we pay attention to. We, we talked about schemas already. Th- these are the people that we have the most experience with. Most commonly, we're going to be interacting with people of our own age, and we're, we're just more interested in people of our own age than we are of people of other ages. Is that the same for ethnicity as well, where we find it easier to recognize people of our own culture and ethnicity? It is. So there, so there is a cross-race effect. We're better at identifying uh, people who are our own ethnicity uh, who, and people of another ethnicity. And again, this is attributed to uh, experience. So for example, uh, there's a really good study to, to demonstrate this. So in the study, they had uh, Korean participants and they had uh, white uh, European participants. And they had them study Korean and white European faces and they produced the, the typical effect that we find in these types of studies where the Korean participants were better at identifying the Korean faces and the uh, white Europeans were better at identifying the white European faces. But the neat thing about this study is that they had a third uh, condition where they had people of Korean ethnicity who were adopted by white European families and, and they grew up in France. And, and these people were actually performed more similar to the white Europeans. So they were better able at identifying the white European faces than the Korean faces, even though you know, if you looked at them, you would say, well, that person looks Korean. They are Korean ethnicity, but they just had more experience with white European faces. So they, they had the same schema that the white Europeans had. Interesting. So it's, it really comes down to experience then what you're seeing on a regular basis. Yeah, that that's the the most prominent explanation. There are other ones, uh, but the, the one that is is the most mixed is this idea that it's it's some sort of racial bias and, and, and some sort of that you know we're we're doing it because we have negative attitudes towards people of, of another ethnicity. The early research was all showing that 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 wasn't a factor, and that I've seen a study recently suggesting that that it might be uh, have a role. But whether that's true or not, there's a lot of evidence that that it's a cognitive phenomenon. Before we, we move on here to an, another area, Ryan, I just want to ask about the confidence of a witness. Does confidence relate to accuracy in the police lineup context? 
Well, I, I need to distinguish first between uh, confidence at trial and confidence at the time of, of a pretrial identification procedure. So at the time of trial, confidence is not a reliable indicator of accuracy. Every witness is going to be convinced they're, that they're accurate by the time they get to trial, even if they weren't so sure uh, at the time of the identification. And there's a lot of reasons for this, but the bottom line is that witnesses usually don't think that uh, an investigation of an innocent person is going to, to make it to trial. And police and prosecutors are going to be constantly reassuring them of that uh, along the way. Uh, so you, you can't trust confidence uh, at the time of trial. The, the question really is whether confidence at the time of the identification can be trusted. And it's definitely more reliable than uh, at trial, but only if all the best practices are used at the identification procedure. And uh, even when the lineup is conducted properly, there's some debate about how much we can rely on confidence. In the recent literature, some people have, have suggested suggested that it's highly reliable and that if someone's 90 to 100% confident that, that you can trust that identification. But there are some issues with the research that they're basing that on. And, and uh, essentially, they're relying on the hope that there's going to be a perfectly fair lineup and, and that you know every person in the lineup is going to be just as likely to be identified as, as, a, as another person if the perpetrator is not in that lineup. But I, I'm skeptical that such a, a perfectly fair lineup is achievable. So, and the, the inference that confidence is reliable depends on, on a perfectly fair lineup. So in a perfect world, looking at the time of the actual ID, if you're satisfied that the lineup was, was very fair or perfect, if such a thing is achievable, then it might be a correlation with, with accuracy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and we can achieve that in the lab, but it's, it's questionable whether anything close to that would happen in practice. All right, Rod. So I do want to talk to you about just how courts assess the potential accuracy or the reliability of an eyewitness identification from these police lineup procedures. And we chatted earlier about some of the different social pressures and cognitive factors that might impact the accuracy or reliability of a witness's identification. But there's from Gary Wells, a famed researcher in this area, he came up with this idea of system and estimator variables. Can you just briefly tell us what those are? Sure. He's basically distinguishing between relevant factors in an eyewitness identification case that either can be controlled by the criminal justice policies, so that those are system variables, and factors that can't be controlled uh, through policy. So he, he called these estimator variables because we can only really estimate the influence that they might have had in the case. We're not really so good at that. So for an example of estimator variables would be if, you know, if the witness only briefly saw the perpetrator or if the perpetrator was wearing a disguise, criminal justice policies aren't going to change these type of factors. And often estimator variables are, are to do with how how the event was witnessed. But the criminal justice policies can influence how the lineup is administered. So for example, policies about the instructions that are given to the witness, you know, who administers the lineup, who the fillers are, those types of things are, are called system variables because we can tell you know, the investigators how, how to uh, implement those procedures through policy. Okay. And is it then fair to say, Ryan, that this is what the courts will use to assess, like a judge or a jury will use some of these, uh, these estimator variables or system variables to assess an eyewitness's reliability or the accuracy in their identification? Yeah, their courts are, are especially interested in estimator variables. These reliability assessments that were developed in the 1970s before we started studying lineups scientifically. And the estimator variables are really intuitive. So these are the things that they came up with because there wasn't a, a scientific basis to go with. So uh, when you're assessing reliability in court, normally you're, you're thinking about how long the, the person was viewed for, uh, whether they were able to pay attention, how far away they are. And the, the only factor that is often considered by courts that I would call a system variable is confidence. And, and we consider confidence, eyewitness confidence, a, a system variable because we can have policies about how confidence is collected. So for example, collecting it immediately at the time of the identification rather than waiting until the witness gets to trial and, and their confidence uh, judgment isn't more valid. But a lot of system variables just don't get the attention that the estimator variables do because because when these reliability assessments were developed, Developed. We just didn't know about all, all the system variables at that time. And in your opinion, is there? do you think there needs to be more consideration of some of the system variables in the court or trial context? 
Absolutely. You know, the, the, the estimator variables are really important. So it's not to, to d- diminish uh, the role that they can play, but the system variables are something that often are more informative because say, for example, if you know that uh, in the course of the investigation, the witness saw a mugshot of the defendant before they saw a lineup containing that defendant. That right there would basically render the lineup identification uninformative because you don't know if the witness is identifying uh, the defendant based on seeing that person at the crime or seeing that person in a mugshot after the crime. And if there's anything like that that happened in the case, again, a system variable, uh, whether whether there was a mugshot viewing or not, the courts need to know about that. And, and those can be a strong signal uh, that that something went wrong in the case. So based on our conversation today, Brian, and reading your work and the work of others, it does seem like ensuring a fair and appropriate police lineup is no simple task. It seems very complex and a difficult thing to really make sure that you're following the perfect procedure and not influencing someone's memory, not biasing them in any way. So there could be some in our society that say, given all these different avenues where we could go askew here and that there could be complexities and difficulties, why are we using police lineups and, and mugshot procedures? What are your thoughts on such positions? Do you think there's still a useful aid for police departments or do you think they need to be of limited use? Well, I, I have some colleagues who are, are experts in, in lineups and, and they've said similar things. They, they just don't believe that people are capable of, of com- completing lineups accurately enough for eyewitness identifications to have any weight uh, in court. I take a more moderate view. You know, we've talked earlier about how lineups provide direct evidence of guilt. So if you take lineups away entirely, well, suddenly there's a lot more cases that depend on circumstantial evidence. And the other thing is that, you know, someone victimized by by a perpetrator and they say they can identify them, I think we should give them the opportunity to try. And I I think there needs to be more than than just a lineup identification to convict someone. Uh, I've already mentioned uh, to you this report by by Devlin, that that UK judge in the 1970s. So Devlin reviewed wrongful convictions that, that were happening in the UK, and he concluded that there should never be a conviction based entirely on the, an eyewitness identification from a single witness. He said it was just too risky. And he recommended that for someone to be convicted in an identification case, there needs to be additional evidence to corroborate that identification. And the UK never adopted that rule, but I think he got it right. I think uh, identification needs to be part of the, the prosecution's case, but it shouldn't be all of the prosecution's case. I think you need to go beyond just identification-only cases. And in the, in the Heads of Prosecution Guidelines in Canada, actually, they, they do recommend extreme caution in identification-only cases, but the door is still open for a conviction based on the identification of a single witness. Do you think there needs to be more legal regulation and or uniform standards in Canada with respect to how police lineups are administered? I do. The The guidelines in Canada are, they're okay. They're fairly progressive and there are little tweaks that, that I would uh, recommend. For example, on the issue of the lineup administrator, the Canadian guidelines say that that person should be blind to the identity of the suspect if possible. And those two words, I, I don't think should be in the recommendation because there are other, other jurisdictions that don't have those two words and, and they seem to be getting by just fine. And once you put those two words in there, it opens the door for, for it not to happen. And there is really no reason. Uh, I mean, even if you can't get someone who doesn't know who the suspect is, there are procedures that you could use to prevent knowing who the witness is looking at at a certain time, what we call a blinded line of procedure. So, you know, rather than saying if possible, maybe saying do a, use a blind administrator if there's one available, and if not, do a blinded procedure. I'd, I'd be happy with something like that. And the other thing uh, with, with Canadian procedures is that, as we've talked about earlier, each police agency can can interpret them guidelines in their own way. And there, there's going to be variability in, for example, uh, the fillers that they're using and the types of databases that they have access to. This is in contrast to, for example, the UK, where they have a national agency that maintains a database of images. And uh, when, when a new suspect image is recorded, uh, what they do is they send that to this agency for quality control, and they make sure that that image is, meets the standard of all the other images. 
services. And we just don't have anything like that uh, in Canada. And, you know, another innovation I, I think that we should adopt from the UK is to have someone in the police agency who regularly administers lineup rather than just having, you know, kind of whoever's available or whoever's on the case. In the United Kingdom, they have someone called an identification officer. And the identification officer, that's all they do is administer lineups. And they're quite good at what they do because they do it every day. And, you know, in Canada, you know, the person administering the lineup, it might have been six six months since they did one previously, and they're less likely to to do it properly than, than someone who that's their job every day. Uh, another thing in Canada, there, there's no requirement to have a defense lawyer present at identification procedures. Other countries, they do. And you know, one big idea that that's been put out there recently by by Gary Wells is that we need to be a, a little bit more cautious before putting someone into a lineup. He's he's come up with this uh, idea that there should need to be reasonable suspicion of someone before you put them into a lineup because you know the the best way to prevent wrongful convictions due to misidentification is to stop putting innocent people into lineups. And if there's there's no minimum evidence required to put someone into a lineup, then you're going to get more innocent people in those lineups. So, so those are some ideas for, for how Canada's recommendations could be improved in, in, in terms of making sure those those guidelines make it into practice. I mean, right now, there's almost nothing about lineups in the criminal code in Canada. Uh, so that's, you know, I, I think it's not an easy task to do to amend the criminal code, but that's something that, that would increase the likelihood that these, these recommendations are actually being followed. One question I will ask that just popped in my, my head while you were talking, Ryan, is the idea that you should only be using, you know, there should be a reasonable suspicion before you put someone into a lineup. If you're using a lineup of, of 10 people, for instance, right, like there's only potentially one suspect and then everyone else is not guilty of that crime. Should you make sure that the other nine people in the in the pack or your lineup are from a totally different geographic area? Because if someone comes in and you know you have someone that might be a known a no, known to the police or known to commit these types of crimes, but in this case they actually didn't commit the crime, but then the person picks them, you know, is there a way to get around that that concern? Yeah, it's it's a very good point you're raising, uh, Trevor, and that's that th this there should be reasonable suspicion of the suspect, but there should be no doubt that the other people in the lineup are innocent. And you know, taking photos from different jurisdictions is is a common way to do that. Another way is you know if if uh, it's appropriate to use mug shots of people who who have a criminal past, what you could do is use people who were in custody at the time of the offense. Uh, there are ways of, of making sure that the fillers are known to be innocent. And it's something that we as researchers, as I think, sometimes take for granted because we assume that, you know, if the witness identifies a filler, that person's not getting investigated. But that, that assumption might uh, not uh, always hold true. And I've heard anecdotal stories uh, of in Canada of, of uh, filler being investigated. And I've also heard uh, of jurisdictions where there's a policy of investigating fillers. In South Africa, for example, there if a filler is identified, there's an obligation to investigate that person. That's not what they should be doing. These people should be known innocents so that the majority of the mistaken identifications that witnesses are making are going to be immediately known to be an error. So if you get 10 people in the lineup, nine of those are known innocents. If the suspects happens, if the suspect happens to be innocent, they're going to be, if it's a fair lineup, they're unlikely to be chosen. And the other people, uh, if the witness mis mistakenly identifies them, uh, we don't have to worry about a wrongful conviction because they were in custody or they're, they're from, they live 10,000 miles away. And that's going to reduce the risk uh, of lineups substantially. All right, Ryan, this has been uh, really fascinating. I've learned a lot in our conversation today, and I can't thank you enough for, for coming on to, uh, to discuss these issues with us. Before we leave, Ryan, I just want to ask, is there social media that people can follow you or research that they can support? Yeah, well, I am on uh, Twitter, and uh, another good place to, to learn about uh, my research is uh, my website, which is www.eyewitnesslab.com. And you know, all I, I make sure that uh, all my publications are you know you can get PDFs of the articles there, and even the data I try to put up there as much as possible. We'll link some of your articles, your the Eyewitness Lab, and your your Twitter handle in our show notes when we post it. Ryan, I can't thank you again for for coming on. All right, my pleasure, Trevor. Thanks. 